This episode is brought to you by Philips One by Sonicare. One up your brushing with Philips One. It's a big step up from your manual toothbrush with both rechargeable and battery powered versions so you can choose the one that best fits your life. Learn more at philips.com slash one. That's P-H-I-L-I-P-S dot com slash O-N-E. Hello, I'm Gavin St. James, the junior producer for What the Hell Were You Thinking? It is June, and that means it is our new annual Pledge Drive Month, where we ask you to support What the Hell Were You Thinking and all the fine podcasts on the Salsa Kings Podcast Network. It is also the month of host Dave Bledsoe's birth, and he feels that alone should compel you to help in any way that you can. Of course, he would prefer that help in the form of monetary compensation via our Patreon, patreon.com slash whatthehellpodcast, but he would only use that money for liquor, cigarettes, and the company of sex workers. As poor women, no one should have to endure that. So perhaps you will feel as queasy as I do about that. You can also help by recommending the show to a friend. Take their phones, follow the show on their podcast app, or perhaps spam them on their social media. It helps others find the show and understand the living hell I endure every week working with that man. Also support the good shows on the network. Head over to SeltzerKings.com and find something that does not have a raging alcoholic egomaniac. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your support. Yes, Gavin, we know your university had actual catacombs beneath it. No one cares you went to Oxford or Cambridge or even to Walmart. Ass. The following podcast contains... You used to be a kind, loving man, and now you're a foul-mouthed monster! Explicit language. Hello and welcome to the podcast that asks a simple question. When you went looking to play your LARP game in the tunnels underneath Rice Science Building, what the hell were you thinking? I'm your host, Dave Bledsoe, and this is episode number 319, The True Tale of Dallas Egbert, where we talk about that one sad kid and uh, why it made my mom so freaked out she made me stop playing Dungeons & Dragons. Stay tuned. The What the Hell You Thinking podcast is brought to you by the Live Action Role Playing Association of America, LARPA. We want you to know that we're not that weird. LARPA represents people who like to dress in armor and robes while running around the woods pretending to be wizards and warriors, which isn't as weird as it sounds. It's just normal, nerdy fun. It's acting, people. We aren't raising demons out there no matter what the church tells you. LARPA wants you to know that we don't think we can actually cast spells and we know dragons aren't real. And that what we are doing is just having fun. So unclench your undergarments and lighten the fuck up. Live Action Role Playing Association of America. It's not like we're furries or anything. Robbie! 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 Pardue, what are you doing? Going to join the Great Hall. You can't. It's a trap. I have spells. I'm going to fly. You don't have enough points. I am the maze controller. Mesca? Maze control? Yes. And I have absolute authority in this game. Game? Game. Game. TJ, what am I doing here? Kid, why can't I remember? I went to college, for a minute anyway, and I went to a very, very good university, one of the top in the nation. Now, you're probably wondering how someone who admittedly was at the very best and uh, unenthusiastic student in high school. Yeah, that's putting it mildly. Who did not so much as take a single placement exam for college and spent a decade in the military drinking and whoring, found himself attending a prestigious institution of higher education? You cheated. I did not cheat. I found a loophole. I got a job working there, and tuition was free for employees. 
was all very progressive. My job was being a campus cop, and while I have stories to tell about that, this is not the show for those. Without naming names, this was a very, very old, for North America, institution. The campus was filled with history and mystery, gothic buildings, and a graveyard full of dead Jesuits. And being in D.C., close ties to the government. Could be the security officer, Georgetown. Okay, look, it's not a secret where I went. It's just that they were very, very vocal about my not mentioning that I actually attended the institution any fashion after the uh, alleged incident. One of the mysteries of that campus was, of course, the tunnels beneath said campus, long rumored to connect to a vast network of tunnels beneath Washington, D.C., which are a real thing, but nowhere near as cool as rumor makes them out to be. And just like the tunnel running between the science building and the old hospital psych building on Georgetown, I'm sorry, that institution. Its existence was whispered as by students, well-known by staff, and totally underwhelming in reality. It was just a utility tunnel under a street filled with old junk. Boring. It really was. Now, rumor had it that the tunnel was used to move patients involved in the CIA's MK Ultra experiments taking place at the university discreetly between labs in the science building and labs in the psych department. And while the university definitely participated in MK Ultra experiments and received money through hidden cutouts for performing a human experimentation using drugs on unknown patients and all sorts of sadie shit, it didn't take place in the tunnel. They did it right there in the open because in the 1950s and early 60s, no one questioned anything the CIA was doing. You don't need secret tunnels. We got to already got your brainwashed society. Still, the secret tunnels were cool, and people were going to make associations like that when you have secrets and tunnels in such close proximity. The only reason I even bring it up is because secret tunnels play a huge role in our topic this week. But no, they don't. Well, okay, people thought they played a huge role in our topic this week, and that will be important later on. In fact, a lot of things will come up in the story that don't have anything to do with the actual story, but people thought they did, and that's why they were so important. Obtuse. You're being obtuse. I'm not being obtuse, but pretty much everyone else in this story was. Our tale begins with a smart, perhaps a genius young man, by the name of James Dallas Egbert III. There is a special hull going through life with someone else's name. I say this to you as a junior. A junior? Yeah, a junior. You're always being compared to your senior, no matter how different you are from your dad. And being a third? Fuck that. Unless your name includes your royal highness, being a third would be unbearable. I don't know how Egbert felt about being a third, but based on everything else in his life, probably the same way I do or worse. Born in 1962 and growing up in a suburb of Dayton, Ohio. Poor bastard. Dallas. He went by Dallas because when your other options are James Jr. or Egbert, you're going to want to go with Dallas, was a child prodigy. He excelled at math and science. In 1974, at the age of 12, he was called upon by the United States Air Force at nearby Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to diagnose and repair a computer problem, stumping everyone else, and he did it. At the same time, Dallas suffered from something so many kids like him would recognize instantly. He was called quirky and a loner. But what they really meant is people didn't like him because he was a huge nerd and didn't have great social skills. Also, he was into fantasy and science fiction in a huge way, which in the 1970s did not help you get laid. On top of all this, being a huge freaking genius, Dallas graduated high school early and went to Michigan State University at the age of 16, meaning he was now even further out of his element. And the cherry on top of this man's shitty life Sunday was also that James Dallas Egbert III was gay. This shouldn't have been a problem, obviously, but it was 1979, so you know it was. On August 15th, 1979, Dallas disappeared from his dorm room. He had lunch that day with a friend in the dining hall, and that was the last time he was seen on campus. Despite being only 16, his parents were not notified of his disappearance until five days later, on August 20th. It was the late 70s. And disappearing was entirely common. College students sometimes just disappeared, turning up months or years later or not. I couldn't find evidence to show the police investigated his disappearance in any way or that anyone really much cared, which was also pretty par for the course in 1979. In this case, however, Dallas's family had money 
and ties to expertise. And that's how the other character in this tale, Detective William Deere, comes into this case. And that is when people started to care. William Deere, a detective out of Dallas, the, the one in Texas, not, not, not the one in the story, uh, was already well known before this case as kind of a celebrity detective. And this case would not do him any harm for his reputation. And that reputation was one for being a decent criminal investigator, but also a very good self-promoter. He would go on to be involved in other high-profile investigations that were much less about finding out what happened and much more about getting William Deere on television. And it goes without saying that those investigations were definitely mission accomplished. And as Deere began to investigate the detail of Dallas's disappearance, some details began to come to light that led to some very dark places. Highly erroneous conclusions were arrived at, and wildly speculative theories were developed that had very little to do with what happened to Dallas Egbert and everything to do with ginning up publicity in any form possible, apparently under the idea that no publicity is bad publicity. So let's, uh, let's begin with the facts of the case as we actually know them to be. In his room, there was a note written in a crude handwriting that investigators did not believe to be that of Dallas Egbert, though we would later find out he was his, only written with his non-dominant hand, and that note strongly implied suicide. There was also a collection of poems that Egbert was reading, and pushpins arranged in an L-shaped pattern on his cork board. Quoting from the website Geek 6, quote, Detective William Deere noticed the outlines resemble the shape of a few of the buildings from campus, most notably the old power plant. Deere, an expert on recovering missing persons, believed the pins to be a map. He eventually gained permission to investigate the campus's supposedly closed off tunnels from a reluctant university board. And as he explored the tunnels, he noted Egbert's map correctly matched the rooms beneath the campus. There were pins to note every spot, except for one, the small cavern Egbert tried to end his life in, unquote. Now I'm gonna tell you what actually happened to Dallas Egbert because Dallas Egbert, spoiler alert, survived and came back to tell the story to Deer. I'm taking this from a very well-researched piece I found on kushjar.com, which is a strange-sounding website, and it was archived, but is also summarizing from Deer's book, The Dungeon Master, which don't even get me started. Anyway, quote, caused or exacerbated in the opinion of an MSU psychologist, parental pressure, criticism, academic pressure, and the failure of all persons to realize that although Dallas Egbert was a genius, he was socially retardant, in some respects could be considered mentally retarded. According to Dr. Louise Saus, an MSU professor who specialized in psych child psychology, the case was an example of the very costly price asked of some children. Their own image becomes one so perfect that they dare not fail to live up to it. And at the same time, fear of success can become just as great as or greater than fear of failure. It's the constant demand to be a star, unquote. And in addition to this, or because of this, Dallas was also heavily using drugs and using his knowledge of chemistry to manufacture drugs that he would use or sell. And on August 15th, Dallas decided he would kill himself. Again from Kush Jar, quote, On August 14th, 1979, he decided to stop thinking about it and do it. He wrote what he described as a contingency suicide note, disguising his handwriting by writing with his left hand. He created a pattern of pins on his notice board. I meant it as a combination map and suicide note. The map would show where I was if you could find me. The note, the message I intended to convey, was that I was dead. If that is how things turned out. I didn't really know what was going to happen. From the basement of Case Hall, he walked into the steam tunnels. He took with him a blanket, cartons of milk, some cheese and crackers, some marijuana, and what he believed was enough sleeping tablets to kill himself. He went to the small room he had selected in the tunnels. He smoked his marijuana, considered his life, he thought about computers, his drug problems, his relationship with his parents, and his sexuality. And for the first time in months, he felt he was thinking clearly. No, it was clear to me what had to be done. I was depressed, I was miserable, and not even sorry. I should have done it before. Life was no good to me, and this was the best and only solution, unquote. The uh, sleeping pills, they didn't work. He awoke the following day, uh, came out of the tunnels, and went to a friend's house off campus, and stayed with him about a week. He told his friend what had happened, and his friend urged Egbert to call someone, anyone, to get help, but Egbert refused, stating he would just run away and kill himself again if the man told anyone what was going on. So the man did as Dallas demanded, not only out of friendship, 
but out of a real fear of police investigation that would reveal that the two of them were having sex and Dallas was still legally a minor. This was entirely consensual according to Dallas and the man and not really that weird. It's, it, I could do a whole podcast about this, but that's not my podcast to do. After a week or so, Dallas was relocated to another house and then spent the next couple of weeks on what he described as a drug bender. Not the fun, sexy time kind. But, but rather the uh, sort of self-destructive, leaving Las Vegas kind of drug bender. After this, he shuffled around between connections before one of his friends of friends decided Dallas was getting too hot to have in their house and put Dallas on a train to New Orleans with a number to call when he arrived. On the train, Egbert sobered up, realizing that things were actually getting worse and not better since he ran away, and that maybe it was time to do something. Upon arriving in New Orleans, he checked into a hotel, bought the ingredients to make cyanide, mixed it up, and drank it with root beer, and awoke the next morning to find that his suicide attempt had failed. Oh, come on, on, man! So he called the number he was given to get help in New Orleans, only to find out it had been disconnected. And Dallas Egbert found himself where so many of us have been before, hungover, penniless, and homeless in New Orleans. Brother, I've been there. Somehow, Dallas began to pull himself back together. He contacted his first friend that he'd stayed with after his initial suicide attempt, someone who actually did care about Dallas, but also didn't want to go to jail for aiding and abetting a minor and all that, you know, gay sex stuff, which he definitely would have. And he slowly began coaxing Dallas to call William Deere. And in New Orleans, a friendly Samaritan got Egbert a job as a roustabout on an oil rig, which, uh, wow, bold move for a 17-year-old youngster out of Dayton, Ohio. I don't know really what a roustabout does. All I know is that even in my youth, I couldn't have done it And definitely not as a 17-year-old computer science nerd from Dayton, Ohio. After another week or so, a combination of his friend from Michigan and his new friend in New Orleans, and just not being on the lowest cycle of his depression, convinced Dallas to get in contact with Deer and finally come back. Over the next few days, Egbert and Deer spoke and arranged for his return, and his disappearance was finally solved. He lived happily ever after. Oh, no. No, he, he, he shot himself in the head and died less than a year later. Look, this was the... A short, short version! ...of the Dallas Egbert story, which, for all of its sadness, isn't unusual or unheard of by any means. Not in 1979, not in 2021. A bright young man is suffering from mental illness and struggling to come to grips with his sexuality. He spirals out of control into suicidal ideations and is saved by the intervention of friends and maybe the kindness of strangers and a little good luck. And I was snippy about William Deere at the beginning of the show because of what William Deere became. And honestly, he was involved with that stupid alien autopsy videos of the 90s and a bunch of other sensationalized bullshit, including, you guessed it, the O.J. Simpson case. But he really did want to find Dallas and went to extreme lengths not to only get the boy back safely, but to protect him when he found out what really happened. He could have easily just cast his check told the real story, and went on to another case. But instead, he kept Dallas's secret about being gay, about his drug abuse, about his problems with his parents, and let the media run with the far more sensationalist stories about role-playing games and Satanism, because this dropped right as the satanic panic was really getting rolling, and this scary new game called Dungeons & Dragons was freaking out the parents. Deer wrote the book The Dungeon Master four years after Egbert's death, wanting to clear up the misrepresentations by the media, stemming from his earliest theories about what happened to Dallas Egbert and to take the task for creating a panic. But it was way, way too late. And why am I even discussing this? Why do you vaguely think you've heard about this before? What the fuck is it about this story that just, I don't know, tickles something to the back of your brain? Well, the answer to why I'm doing is honestly hashtag content, but also because this story gave us the goddamn American treasure, Tom Hanks, in his very first leading dramatic role in the thinly fictionalized version of this story that Pod Friends is very much in this show's wheelhouse. But also, I kind of want to tell you how even the most well-intentioned lie can cause 
some really bad and unexpected damage. Because as we've seen, the truth about what happened to James Dallas Egbert III was pretty unpleasant to hear. He was a mentally ill young man with dominating parents and struggling to deal with being gay in a world where being gay meant being a social exile from everything he knew. And Dallas was already a social exile because he was smarter than everyone else and probably, oh, come on, hell, he was definitely on the autism spectrum. He suffered from depression and his family, his university, his friends had no fucking clue how to help him, even if he had came forward and people did not come forward in 1979. Everyone failed Dallas Egbert, even William Deere, who honestly was trying to help him, and that's the truth of this story. But that isn't the story people know, if they know it at all. The story people know is the lie that Deer let stand to cover for Dallas's real problems. And that some kid freaked out playing some new game called Dungeons and Dragons and ran off to the tunnels underneath his college to play this strange new game in real life. They lost touch with reality, became his character in that scary new game, and wound up going totally insane because of the game. Two years after Dallas's suicide, there was a movie thinly based on the tale because of a book that was written thinly based on the tale, and that's the legend in the gaming community called Mazes and Monsters, where 26-year-old Tom Hanks goes to college, already suffering from emotional and psychological problems, becomes friends with another group of similar misfits through the love of this fictional game, Mazes and Monsters. Hanks' character freaks out, runs away, and is found in the climax of the movie on top of the World Trade Center, about to jump, believing that he, like his character in the game, can just fly down. He is stopped by his maze controller who uses the game's rules to stop him from jumping. The movie ends with Hanks spending the rest of his life in a psychotic state. That sounds awful. It was both as a movie and as a message to send to people with mental illnesses. People mix the real story of Dallas Egbert with the fictional story of Tom Hanks' character in a shitty made-for-TV movie based on a shitty book that was ripped from the most salacious elements of newspaper headlines and fed into a, glo a growing moral panic about Satanism in the United States. William Deere did not intend any of that to happen. Hell, he was as clueless about Dungeons & Dragons as anyone else not playing the game when he encountered it, and his theories about the game were just that theories, ones that he would later discard before Dallas Egbert was ever found. But you know what? They made great stories in the media. Tim Cass, the editor of Ch and chief of TSR's house magazine, Dragon. It would take me too long to explain. It was just a magazine about D&D and gaming that was put out by the company that made D&D. Cask wrote in Dragon while Dallas was still missing, quote, Some of the reporting has been every bit as bizarre as the circumstances surrounding the whole affair. The chief detective hired by the parents has made some incorrect statements regarding the game that have only fueled the controversy and added to the misconceptions surrounding it. Unfortunately, the nature of the incorrect answers has led to sensationalist speculation. D&D has been described as a cult-like activity, and every editor knows that cults sell papers or dog food in the case of TV. All of this has been grist for the journalist mills and has resulted in some pretty bizarre headlines, all played on the esoteric aspects of the game, some slanted from the incorrect assumptions. A few choice samples that we have seen here and the only, God, only the gods know how many we haven't include. Missing youth could be on adventure game. Is missing student victim of game. Intellectual fantasy results in bizarre disappearances. Student may have lost his life to intellectual fantasy game. Our student feared dead in dungeon and more of the like. This incident could conceivably affect each of you who reads this. If the bizarre tag sticks, all of us should consider the idea that we might meet with scorn or a macabre fascination or be branded as intellectual loonies in the media. In the view of the distortions caused by the media, it may become incumbent now upon us all to actively seek to correct the misconceptions now formed or forming whenever and wherever possible, unquote. Cask was right. This is exactly what happened. And it tarred a lot of shy, bright kids with the epithet of weirdo or worse, Satanist because they played a game that scared people who knew nothing about the game. I knew a lot of kids not too different from Dallas Egbert growing up playing D&D. In some ways, 
I wasn't too different from Dallas Egbert, although I wasn't burdened by the mental illness and the sexual identity crisis. Today, people joke about the D&D players being dorks and nerds, but back in the day, it wasn't a joke, and the satanic panic hurt a lot of innocent people whose only crime was being a little shy or a little smarter than the rest of the class, or just different. And Dallas was the most notorious suicide because of that difference, but it was hardly the only one. And that is where the well-meaning lie about Dallas had so many unintended consequences. By the time Deer tried to correct the record, the lie was too entrenched, the satanic panic too pervasive, and no one who needed to hear the truth heard a fucking word of it. Look, like I said, I got off light. I came out of those years. Yes, I was affected by them, but I was generally unharmed by them because I wasn't carrying the burdens that Dallas was. Me, I was able to assimilate into the mainstream culture of the 1980s with the usual message. Just enough drugs and alcohol to seem cool, but not so much as to send me over the cliff. How many people wound up addicted, dead, or both? <laughs> I don't know. All I know is it was easier to hide who we really were with those things, whether it be a dweeby D&D &D player or you're struggling with who you loved. We'll never know. And all we can say for sure is the lies sure as fuck didn't help. Didn't help anyone. Not even Dallas Egbert. And he was who the lies were being told to protect. We were so focused on the fictional mazes and monster story of what was happening that we missed the story of James Dallas Egbert and his real cries for help and an entire generation of young people just like him. None of this is William Deere's fault. It was, certainly wasn't Dallas's. In a way, it wasn't even the media's fault who took the sad story of a hurting young man and twisted it into a narrative that hurt others. In the end, it's the fault of our common culture and how we are willing to create any kind of fictional narrative to hide from how broken our society really is. We can all see the fault lines that are growing and all know that knows something needs to be done, but no one can agree on what needs to be done. Better to tell ourselves well-intentioned lies to protect ourselves. And we'll tell those lies about esoteric groups with strange names and maybe mystical overtones. We can blame the other rather than examine ourselves. In the 1980s, it was called D&D &D or Satanic Covens. In the 2020s, it's QAnon and critical race theories. It's all the same old lies to hide dealing with the root of our actual problem we can tell the difference between the lies and the truth. We just like the lies better because lies make some people feel good about being the shitty human being they actually are. So they're always going to prefer the lie. This episode is brought to you by PayPal. Ah, online. It's where PayPal was born. But it's not all dancing cats and double rainbows in cyberspace. I mean, one minute you're trying to outbid Soup Boy 99 on some antique spoons. Next thing, your bank account is nothing but tumbleweeds. But now, PayPal has ventured out into the real world with non-dancing cats and actual rainbows, ready to help you start taking payments in person. It's a safe and easy way to get paid. Just generate your unique QR code in the PayPal app for customers to scan and start accepting PayPal in person today. Learn more at paypal.com slash us slash get QR code. This episode is brought to you by Simply by Frito-Lay. These days, you have a lot going on. But now, thanks to Simply by Frito-Lay, you have one less thing to worry about. So kick back and enjoy your favorite Frito-Lay snacks with ingredients to feel good about, like Simply Blue Corn Tostitos, Sea Salted Ruffles, and even White Cheddar Cheetos Puffs, all made with no artificial colors or flavors. Enjoy what you love and look for Simply Brand snacks online or at a store near you. That is it for our show this week. I will admit, the show took a turn for the dark. It's going to do a cute little show about secret tunnels under universities, which everyone has apparently, at least everyone that I ask on social media. But then I started researching the real story about Dallas Egbert. Why would I joke about that? Why would anyone joke about that? And you can't. So then I was going to go after Deer for being a real asshole and making up stories about D&D. &D. But turns out he wasn't and he didn't. The media did what the media does, but again, they were just telling the story people were willing to listen to, and the story was total bullshit, and here we are. Not every story has a funny side. 
Speaking of being unfunny, rate and review this show so other people find it. Listen, assume you were telling a joke in very poor taste about rating this podcast five stars. All of my inappropriate quips are on the social, the hell underscore podcast on Twitter, and the show name on Facebook. Every poorly thought out anecdote we've ever recorded is at whatthehellpodcast.com. And if you would like to support our continuing effort to find ways to make tragic stories seem lighthearted and humorous, get us a buck on patreon.com slash whatthehellpodcast. We are a proud member of Seltzer King's Podcast Network who really want you to know that their other shows do not try to find ways to make jokes about teenage depression and suicide, and they really wish we didn't either. So for me, Dave, I always knew the game wasn't real, Dad. Bledsoe, producer, no, no, not Blackleaf. No, no, I'm going to die. What does that even mean? Gavin and all the fictional mazers on this show, we want to say, oh, James Dallas Egbert, we are still looking for you. We are still waiting for you to come home. Are you still down there somewhere? We've been searching with torches. I think we found your castle and the ashes of your library. God, this song is awful. I'm so sorry. We'll see you all next week. What the hell were you thinking stars Dave Bledsoe and features Gavin St. James and several fictional minions. The show is produced by Kimberly Steele and a part of the Seltzer Kings podcast network. You can find more information on the show on their website, whatthehellpodcast.com or on Twitter at the hell underscore podcast or on Facebook as what the hell podcast. Thanks for listening. I have no ending for this, so I take a small bow.